Wake up every morning with just the news. All the news and none of the noise. Good morning and welcome to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad that you're with us. Today is Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. It is the last full day of President Donald J. Trump's term. Now, one thing that has been lost in the last two weeks with the heinous assault on the Capitol has been looking at the substantive issue of voter fraud and whether voter fraud actually did occur. And joining me to talk about this very important topic is Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who last week made an arrest on voter fraud. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Doing well. So tell us about this arrest. So we know uh, you put out a, a statement here. You said a San Antonio election fraudster was arrested for widespread vote harvesting and voter fraud. This individual was arrested. Her name was Rachel Rodriguez for election fraud, illegal voting, unlawfully assisting people voting by mail and unlawfully possessing an official ballot. Each charge constitutes a felony under the Texas election code. How many votes do you know or believe that she influenced here? Well, she claimed in her video, we don't typically get evidence this easily where somebody is on videotape confessing to uh, fraud. That's one of the challenges of, of prosecuting voter fraud. It takes a long time. Often it takes a long time to, to, to prove your case. In this case, she's on video acknowledging that she influenced thousands of votes, potentially up to 7,000 votes illegally, and admitted that she was doing it illegally. So you're talking 7,000 votes, and this is someone who was caught on camera. To what extent do you think this is people who aren't caught on camera, and how many other thousands of votes would be at stake? Well, we know that there's significant voter fraud because we're investigating fraud all the time. We have three full-time prosecutors and several investigators. They are absolutely totally busy uh, investigating these cases that we we get referrals on so we don't even get probably we get a fraction of the cases that are referred to as actually happen and then we only have time to investigate so many of those cases so there is significant voter fraud we just don't have the resources to, to cover it all and a lot of states have almost no investigation of voter fraud so the narrative that there's no voter fraud is largely driven by the fact that i think most states don't really prosecute it and this has been a key issue for you. You've really been at the forefront of looking at voter fraud. But what about other states? If, if other states don't make this a priority with the way that you have, what's to say we wouldn't have a repeat of the chaos we saw in 2020? Well, there's no doubt that, th that this is a huge issue for these states to, to deal with. We're dealing with it. We still need more resources to look into voter fraud because, we, as I said, we, we're not getting to all the cases. And we don't have even the investigative resources to go to go find these cases. So. I know that our state is dedicating more resources than probably almost any other state. So this is an issue in other states. And that doesn't even count the whole mail-in ballot scheme and, them, and these other states not following their own, own laws. This just deals with, you know, voter fraud. So states who don't have resources and aren't making, you said your state is probably the highest or one of the highest that's giving funding for this. It sounds like, if I'm hearing you, that we could have Groundhog Day all over again come 2022. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I think the fact that we don't have significant resources in other states dedicated to, to investigating fraud. And second, if these states are willing to let local officials, judges, county officials, local election officials change what the legislature put into law as it relates to mail-in ballots and signature verification and, and drop, drop off boxes, then we're going to have problems going forward. We're never going to know if our elections are, are credible. And what about Republicans? I mean, you're a Republican. How much blame do Republicans get, uh, deserve in, in these states? I think significant because in every one of these states, whether it was the attorney general, whether it was the governor, whether it was the legislature, whether it was the party, somebody should have been challenging these, these changes in the law. We certainly did in Texas. We had 12 lawsuits. We needed to win every single one, every single one of those lawsuits to prevent the massive mail-in ballot fraud that we were thinking was coming, and we did that. We stopped every one of these attempts. There were 12 of them to change state law, and had we not done that, I'm pretty sure we would have been in the same situation as Georgia because our state is demographically very similar to Georgia, and if you look at the results four years ago, our election results were similar to Georgia's four years ago. This time they were divergent because we followed our state law and prevented massive mail-in ballot fraud.
And what about the Trump administration? Because after his 2016 victory, President Trump made this a very big issue. He had a whole commission looking at voter integrity, voter fraud. Vice President Pence was the chair of that. But nothing really ever came of it. Unless, am I missing something? Did anything ever come of that? And why was it just basically shut down and, and went away with no results, no teeth? Here's what I think. I think the Democratic Party, in some form or fashion, had a national strategy to do because of COVID, using COVID as an excuse to go around state law. And because of the, the pressure, I think certain Republican officials felt about COVID, they, they capitulated and caved in, went, thinking maybe that they were disenfranchising voters by not allowing everybody to vote by mail and not verify signatures. The reality is they actually disenfranchised voters by allowing it because we'll never know how credible these elections were. We don't know, like in Pennsylvania, they went from 233,000 mail-in ballots to 2.5 million. We don't know because they didn't do signature verification in many of those cases, whether those ballots are legitimate or not. And, and so the American people are left to wonder, you know, they didn't follow state law, but we can't verify whether these results were fraudulent or not. Okay, so what's the path forward, though, for Republicans? Because Republicans have a lot of questions. Millions of Americans question whether Joe Biden was elected in a, uh, a way that was ethical or legal. But he still will be sworn in tomorrow. He's going to be our president. What's the path forward for Republicans, even if they have many doubts and many skeptical questions about this? So the path forward is going, going over the next at least two years. Republicans need to quickly assess their own states and determine how they're going to deal with this in the future, make sure that they find ways to prevent people from going around, elected officials from going around what state law says. And they need to be prepared, or we will have this happen every single time. And I think you'll quickly find that Republicans aren't able to win elections. Last question before we go to break. I want to read a comment from a Congressman Steve Cohen. He's a Democrat from Tennessee, and he suggested that Trump voters in the National Guard should be viewed as, quote, suspect. He said the National Guard is 90 some odd percent male and only about 20 percent of white males voted for Biden. You've got to figure that in the Guard, which is predominantly more conservative, there are probably not more than 25 percent of the people there protecting us that voted for Biden. The other, other 75 percent are in the large class of folks that might want to do something what, what, what is your take on this real quick? And then we're going to take a break and we can get more of your answer after. Well, look, I, 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 that's just amazing. This guy has obviously never served in the military and doesn't know the sacrifice that these people have made for our, for our country. My, my father was in the Air Force. My daughter's in the Air Force. I, I know lots of people that serve. And they're amazing people that are trying to do the right thing, protecting the country and sacrifice oftentimes their own lives. All right, we're going to go to a quick commercial break and come back more with the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton. We're going to talk also the issue of big tech, tech censorship. Stay tuned. Morning. Welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield. Glad that you're here with us. Well, just before the break, we were talking with Attorney General Ken Paxton of Texas about the issue of the National Guard and a Democratic congressman who says that anyone who voted for Trump who's in the National Guard should be viewed as suspect. And you said something really interesting. And if you could let our viewers know, why do you think this congressman is making this statement now, this Steve Cohen who's saying that any, anyone who's a Trump voter who's in the National Guard should be viewed as suspect? Look, I, it feels to me like they are they are trying to, to focus on limiting our free speech. They don't want us talking about the election. They don't want to talk, talking about voter fraud. They don't want us talking about this. So now there's, there's, you're viewed negatively or you may be punished if you speak out on issues that relate to the election. But we all have different views and, and this country has been great because our founders understood that free speech and the interchange of ideas was, was a really good idea and that people should have that opportunity. They all have the right to speak. And now suddenly it's becoming uh, suspect if you speak out on issues that other people disagree with. In my opinion, that's the wrong direction for the country. Well, that brings me to the next topic, which is an action that your office took last week. So your office took action. You issued an investigative demand for five leading tech companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon Web Services, and Apple. Tell us more about this investigation. What are you looking to do? Well, so for years, you've heard people discuss, there's been anecdotal evidence. Um, they've, they've apparently done this in the past numerous times, but to, to take the, the, an entire platform down because the platform had the president on it, 
is clearly something that affects free speech in this country and affects competition. And so we're we're going to try to figure out what happened. We've you know we've asked questions of five different tech companies, and we want to get to the bottom of this and understand what their policies are, what the plan is for the future, and whether people are going to have the ability to speak in this country or whether these tech companies are going to limit speech based on your views. So it seems like this this Friday night massacre, as some allies of the president have called it, where the president was stripped of Twitter, but it, it all seemed to be, the dominoes all seemed to be falling at once. So the company Parler was, uh, you know, ripped from the Apple store, from, uh, you know, from any, uh, you know, iOS phone, um, and also it was stripped from being able to have access to the cloud services by Amazon. So it seemed like there was a lot of things in terms of companies coalescing. Do you think there was collusion here? Do you think there was behavior that was monopolistic and, and people actually talking about this in a very overt way? Or, or did this just all happen happenstance? So statistically, it's possible that all five of these companies did something at the same time to affect the same person, but the odds of that are probably pretty high. I don't know the, the number, but it's probably a pretty low percentage chance that this was random. Either way, we're investigating it to find out what the truth is. And if it was random, then we'll hopefully find that out. If it wasn't, then we need to deal with the possibility that these companies are colluding to limit free speech and to limit viewpoints that they disagree with. And what do you say to those who say, well, these are private companies. This is not a First Amendment issue because the First Amendment has to do with the government suppressing freedom of speech. But these are private companies or publicly traded companies, but in any case, the private sector. Two issues. One is that if they are, have a monopoly on the market, then we, we have an issue there because that's the, that may be the only platform where you can speak on, on certain issues. And, and then second, the fact that they are colluding and potentially working together is potentially an, an issue as well because that's also potentially an antitrust violation. So in terms of the, uh, you know, the way to prove that it's a First Amendment violation, how would you go about doing that? So that's why we have these civil, they're called CIDs, civil investigative demands. They're like interrogatories or questions about policies and practices and trying to understand what they are doing we're not necessarily going into this with, with, with our own bias. We're trying to look at what has actually happened. It looks like collusion. Now, it may not be, and we're, we're open-minded about what we're, we're going to find. We're hopeful that, you know, that there is some explanation for this, but we'd like to know the truth because we think consumers and that the American public and certainly my constituents deserve to be treated fairly. And this is an issue that does unify folks on the left and the right. We have seen some liberal journalists speaking out and saying this, this uh, you know, targeting and deplatforming is constitutes a suppression of speech. So it seems to be an issue that attracts bipartisan support. Do you anticipate you're going to get help at the federal level with the Biden administration? I certainly hope so. They should be concerned about it as well. Free speech is not a Republican Democrat issue. It's an American issue. It's a constitutional issue. It's something that we've all been guaranteed as a as a birthright as citizens of the United States. And so whether whatever party you're from should not matter. If if they are doing it to one side, they could be doing it to the other side. And so as, as soon as you start saying, well, it's OK if they limit your viewpoint, if you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat, then I think we end up finding harm for the future of our country. So one of the things the president said the night that he was stripped of Twitter, he said, I predicted this was happen. I said this was going to happen. I forewarned it. That's why I was so keen on Section 230 and reforming that and making sure that these companies who said they were just agnostic, hey, nothing to see here. I'm just a platform. I don't make editorial judgments, but therefore I need to have these special protections under Section 230. He said that because these changes weren't made, this is part of why he predicted this would happen. What's the step forward? on Section 230. Do you agree with the president on that assessment? And is, is there anything to be done at this point? Yes. One of the things that the, the other big issue related to this is that they put these companies put themselves out as, as neutral platforms. They're they're out to let everybody have a chance to speak. If in reality they're not doing that, one, they don't deserve the protection of federal law, special protection that no other company has. And two, they may need to be looked at under consumer protection laws because they're they're presenting consumers with a choice that says we are a a platform that allows any speech when in reality they are controlling what speech is being put out there 
and let's just look globally here a little bit because uh, folks would always say that Trump was Mr. Go It Alone, but you're seeing leaders like Angela Merkel over in Germany, also the president of Mexico saying similar things, being very concerned about what's happening here with freedom of speech. And, and it's not just a U.S. issue. And, and even the Kremlin uh, has joined the European Union in denouncing uh, you know, big tech for squelching freedom of speech online. So the irony here for a lot of folks seems to be that this is the Russians uh, preaching to Americans and, and Westerners about the virtues of free speech. What do you think the, the path forward here? Again, the world seems to be uh, united, in, in, at least for many countries here, uh, behind this. Do you think this will make any difference for the tech companies? It is kind of sad that we're being lectured by other countries, but I think they're right. And I, and I think that, that, that this is an international issue because they have, these tech companies have such control over the market, over, over speech. And I think people around the world realize that if we don't protect that, if we don't find a way to make sure that these companies are offering up a platform that allows everybody an opportunity to speak, then we are, in, we are all going to suffer. And so I think the path forward is I think Congress needs to repeal 230. And, and not give these companies special protection. I think states need to look at potentially investigating these companies. It should not be just Texas. It should be, you know, every state should be investigating these, these free speech issues because look, in the end, we're all gonna be affected by this either positively or, or negatively. And if we don't take precautions now, it may be too late down the road. So what's the path forward for conservatives who feel like they're being censored? What specifically can a conservative do now here in America? I think they need to speak out. I think they need to continue to speak out. They need to speak out more than they ever have, because I think we're at a critical point in, in the whole discussion of, of free speech and whether these, these big tech companies are going to become even more powerful over the next couple of years. Look, they make lots of political donations, so they have tremendous impact on policy. They also make a, you know, they have a lot of money to go hire lawyers and defend whatever they do. And I think there's a lot of arrogance, and I think there's a, there needs to be a real focus on this right trouble down the road. All right. Thanks so much, Ken Paxton. We appreciate it. We'll be right back. Your tax dollars at work with this Biden stimulus plan. What's in it? Stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad to have you here with us. Well, let's talk about this $1.9 trillion COVID-related spending plan from, Vice, from President-elect Joe Biden. So conservative critics say that there are many problems with this spending plan. Let's go to starters. For starters, it goes far, far beyond the relief for coronavirus-specific problems. It's also arguably unconstitutional, racist, and sexist, according to critics. It would prioritize taxpayer money to be spent on non-white, non-male-owned business owners rather than taking a color and gender blind approach. That's what the Constitution says. You should be color and gender blind, but that's not what this plan says. Biden's plan would also subsidize teachers unions, even with no guarantee that schools would be opened for students who have been suffering under these lockdowns. We've seen the effects here of, of students being isolated from classrooms. We see what's happened to their behavior. We see mental health uh, spiraling out of control. The other thing about this plan from Biden is that, is that it would layer on trillions to the U.S. deficit and debt, which is already ballooning out of control. Biden's proposal comes on top of the $900 billion passed by Congress and signed by President Trump last month. And that was already on top of the $2.9 trillion stimulus package passed in the spring of 2020, the CARES Act. Now, Bernie Sanders, the self-described democratic socialist, called Biden's stimulus plan just a first installment. This should be a blinking siren red light for those concerned about our nation's future, according to the conservatives I spoke with. In fact, yesterday on this program, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik called the plan, quote, another multi-trillion dollar liberal wish list that she opposes. She said, I just hope that President-elect Biden looks to work with Republicans rather than just really bowing to the far left, the AOC wing of the party, where I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to do that, she said. Now, in full disclosure, the Biden transition team did not respond to a request for comment from myself here and the Justin News team. We are more than happy to have anyone from the Biden administration on this program to discuss these issues, which are very important to our country. And our country is hurting right now because of COVID. 
But this plan actually does far too little to actually address the COVID crisis specifically. This Biden plan carves out $70 billion. That's out of $70 billion out of $1.9 trillion for COVID-related vaccines, therapies, and testing. This is on top of the $42 billion that were passed last month. But critics of the plan, the Biden plan, say that the vast majority of the rest of the funding is more focused on income redistribution to advance long-term democratic social policies. In fact, Brad Palumbo, who's an opinion editor over at the Foundation for Economic Education, he says that he is upset by Biden's statement in a recent video that in fighting the coronavirus, our priority will be black, Latino, Asian, and Native American-owned businesses. We've got that video from Biden. Take a look at this. Our focus will be on small businesses on Main Street that aren't wealthy and well-connected, that are facing real economic hardships through no fault of their own. Our priority will be black, Latino, Asian, and Native American-owned small businesses, women-owned businesses, and finally, having equal access to resources needed to reopen and rebuild. But we're going to make a concerted effort to help small businesses in low-income communities, in big cities, small towns, rural communities that have faced systemic barriers to relief. And you heard it right there from our incoming president that he believes that if you're black or Latino or female, you deserve taxpayer money more than if you are white or if you're a male. Now look, it's true that minority communities have been disproportionately hit by the pandemic. And so, yes, in that sense, we need to make sure the businesses who have been disproportionately hit should be, be affected. But if, you're, if your lens through which you're looking is a racial lens, arguably this is unconstitutional. And, and Brad Palumbo, who I mentioned earlier, he said that it's unclear exactly what form this will take or what the policy specifics would entail. But if Biden intends to act racially discriminatory COVID-19 aid programs in the name of social justice, he'll run into the same moral and legal problems that plague all such misguided efforts. The argument here by Palumbo and others is that, hey, for example, yesterday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. His entire life's work was to make sure that you are judged not by your skin color, but by the content of your character, to be judged by the, the, the situation that you're in, the situation that your business is in, not based on your race. Now, in addition, Biden's plan would also give an additional $1,400 in a check for each American, the vast majority of these Americans who are currently employed. Now, the Americans who would get this, most of them are far above the poverty line. And the cost of this additional check would be an estimated $400 billion. This is borrowing from the future with no plan on how to pay for it. And, you know, I asked these same questions of the Trump administration because President Trump was trying to uh, put forth the same plan. And I asked Treasury officials these same questions. How are we going to pay for this? And here's the other thing. When you're talking about just giving out, quote unquote, free money, there's nothing free in, in this world. Uh, your parents should have taught you. The, the data actually says that when you're giving and writing out these checks, it doesn't even have a boost to the economy. In fact, there are economists, John Kogan and John Taylor, who are senior fellows at the Hoover Institution, they argued in a recent op-ed that the checks won't even provide an immediate boost of economic growth or consumer spending jolt because people don't change their spending behavior unless they see a long-term change, unless they see that they expect that their long-term circumstances are going to change. They don't change their spending habits. And in fact, these economists looked at research from the National Bureau of Economic Research about the CARES Act, the CARES Act that just passed last spring where you pumped in uh, trillions of dollars and, and everyone got a check, everyone got hundreds of dollars. And they looked to see what did people actually do when they got these hundreds of dollars in their checking account. They found that most respondents reported that they primarily saved or they paid down their debts. And only 15 percent, only one five, 15 percent of Americans reported that they actually spent that money. So if, if the idea here is that we want to have a stimulus to the economy, that we want to have a jolt, we want to push, you know, the, you know you're a, you're, you need a lifeline and you need a jolt, uh, only 15% of Americans said they actually spent that check. So why are we doing this? The other point here about Biden's stimulus plan is that he also wants to hike the minimum wage to a uniform $15 an hour nationwide. 
Now, the problem that a lot of critics have with this is they say that it's a rigid standard that is harmful for small businesses in parts of the country that are less expensive. If you're running a small business in Kansas, why should you have to pay the same wage that a business does in New York City or Los Angeles? Economically speaking for folks, this doesn't make any sense. In fact, Akash Chogali, who's with Stand Together, he says that Biden's COVID plan isn't all bad. It includes strategies to curb the virus, for example, but using a relief bill to double the cost of employing people when thousands of small businesses are closing and millions are out of work isn't a solution. It's a foolish partisan wish list item. So Akash's problem here is that he says that this is going to raise the cost of being a business owner. And guess what? This will mean fewer jobs. And we just had a record unemployment report last week, a million people who said that they were unemployed. So this is a big problem. The other problem is that, as, as the Wall Street Journal reported, the editorial board, it argued that schools are going to stay closed. They're still going to be rewarded with $130 billion to open, but there is no guarantee that they're going to be opening. So basically what this is going to do is to line the pockets of teachers' unions, and those teachers' unions are going to fund Democrat politicians. We've seen this show before. All right, folks, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hey there, welcome back here to Just the News AM. I'm Carrie Sheffield and glad you're here with us. So Brandon Strzok, you've heard that name, you've seen the face. He founded the Walk Away campaign. He just got booted off of Facebook. I had an exclusive interview with him. Take a look. And joined by the one and only Brandon Strzok. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good to have you. And we were just talking. You were the first person uh, on camera. Uh, you and I spoke on my show. I used to host a show called Bold TV. And you, my show was the first one where you came out as a conservative. You had been a liberal. You'd been a, just a, you know living in your bubble as a hairdresser, just surrounded by liberal culture. And you came out on my program. So I am very proud to welcome <laughs> you back to my show. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. Um, before I spoke with you, I'd done a handful of, of radio interviews after I first started Walk Away, but yours was the very first on-camera interview that I ever did. And I'd like to note that we also beat Fox News because you were you later did. on with Tucker Carlson. Right. Uh, so, Brandon, you've been dealing with a lot on the censorship front. You've been deplatformed on Facebook, but you're on Instagram, so it's owned by the same company. Why, why are they treating you differently? It seems very inconsistent. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared that you even pointed that out. Um, I, I, I don't know because we still haven't been given any reason why we were taken off of Facebook in the first place. And this is, you know, this isn't just me, too. I want to make clear that what's, I think, you know, unusual, even more unusual about this particular story about me is that they took down the walkaway campaign group. Uh, they banned me. They banned a number of my employees. They banned a number of my volunteers. So this was like a very systemic, far-reaching thing. And uh, we still have not been given any explanation as to why any of this happened. We haven't been uh, confronted with uh, a specific post or anything that we said or did that they said this is the problem. Nothing. And we've been given no recourse either. We've been given no ability to appeal. Uh, when we try to go through the normal appeals process, we just get a message that says uh, this this is a permanent ban and it cannot be undone. Um, and so we just, we have absolutely no idea. So I couldn't even begin to tell you why this happened on Facebook, let alone why it hasn't happened on Instagram. Do you have different, I mean, I, I, I don't want to get you uh, thrown off, but uh, do you have different content on Instagram than the content on Facebook? Well, in a way I do, but see again this all started with the walkaway campaign group so it was basically the group was taken down and then anybody who was an admin or was connected to that group lost their personal accounts but the walkaway campaign only the only content that goes on the walkaway campaign group are testimonials that's it so it has to either be a video or a written testimonial which when people submit them to us they go into a queue i have a team of moderators that reads every post that watch watches every video and we have pretty stringent you know um policies about what constitutes a uh, a testimonial and also do's and don'ts of a testimonial you can't endorse products you can't you know there there's a lot of, of of rules that we have about just telling your own story so these are very stringently uh vetted testimonials that go on this page i would be shocked 
if they could find anything that's on the walkaway campaign group that has an any that that would violate any terms of their conduct and i will stake my life on the fact that there was nothing there that would call for violence or glorify anything that happened on january 6th in washington dc anything like that and the content that goes on my instagram is usually just screenshots of twitter posts that i put out so the content is different uh but i would i would be willing to say that the content on walkway campaign group is actually much more mild than anything i put on instagram it all sounds very orwellian it's no wonder that the book 1984 is shooting up to the top of the charts on amazon book sales uh, uh until they get Yank from the Amazon shelves. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, you just tweeted out that it appears someone is trying to copy you. They say that flattery is the most uh, sincere form of uh, you know, compliment, that someone is apparently trying to take your, your style. So you came out with a very iconic black and white video when you said your journey, you walk people through on camera and you did it in a very uh, you know, dramatic and compelling way. You got millions of people to watch it. And now someone appears to be doing it, but trying to do it in the other direction. Do you know anything about why this is happening and who this person is? I have no idea who the person is. Um, and I think, but the I watched the video. I think I've actually watched it a couple of times at this point. And I can tell you that it's not, so when I created my video in 2018, I put it out, it was really a launch video to launch the walk away campaign. And it was explaining all the reasons why I was walking away from liberalism in the Democratic Party. And it was launching this movement, encouraging other people to tell their stories about why they would like to walk away as well. And here we are a couple of years later with over 508,000 people that joined the movement before Facebook took it down and hundreds of thousands of testimonials. And uh, what this person did, who I, I don't know who he is, but it does seem very similar to the style of the video that I did, but he's not really calling for any type of um, uh, creating a movement or creating energy. It's really just an admonishment of conservatives. And unsurprisingly, it's done in a way that is fraught with a complete uh, lack of connection or understanding to why conservatives feel the way we feel or believe what we believe. I mean, it's really just a lot of sort of CNN talking points about how we're brainwashed, we're in a cult, we're stupid um, and that you know it's glorifying black lives matter saying that they're not a terrorist organization it's admonishing any sort of violence that comes from the right while not acknowledging eight months of violence that rampaged this country on the left causing two billion dollars worth of damage and the lives of more than 45 people uh, it doesn't acknowledge any of those things so it's very very tone deaf it's very sort of just you know typical nasty mean-spirited and it's in the end i mean i think it's going to make its core audience applaud, but it's not going to actually make anybody cha change anybody's hearts or minds in any way, which I feel like my video actually did uh, compel a lot of people to think differently. And ultimately, a lot of people left the left because of it. A commercial break, more with Brandon Strzok. He goes in on, he does not pull back his gunfire against the GOP leadership. He thinks that they're not doing the changes they need, they need to make. Uh, stay tuned, we'll be right back. And welcome back to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield, glad you're with us. So part two, my interview with Brandon Strzok, he goes in on the GOP leadership. He's very upset. He said the winter leadership vote that they just had, they put back in Ronna McDaniel. He disagrees with this. Take a look to see why. I wanna to turn to the topic of the conservative movement. So just looking at the decimation here. So the Senate is now in Democratic hands. The White House is now going to Joe Biden. The House, yes, it, there were some gains in the House of Republicans, but it's still in Democratic hands. What does the conservative movement do going forward? What's the plan? Well, there's going to have to be a complete and total reformation, I think, of the conservative movement in order to succeed. And I, I, to me, this is actually not, it's not a bad thing. It's not a scary thing. I know people are feeling really shook up right now. And I think that's just human nature. Anytime you enter into sort of unknown territory, people become afraid and they become insecure and they become, you know, there's a, there's a destabilization that makes people feel very uncomfortable. But to me, I, just through previous experiences, even in my own personal life, I know that uh, moments like this are, mo are, are 
amazing moments for creation uh, and they're amazing moments for change and reformation. And I think that's what we're going to see now. I don't think that people should be um, upset, as particularly, you know, like with the Senate, there was the, the Georgia runoff where we basically the, our, our control of the Senate hinged upon two candidates in Georgia. And then when we didn't win those elections, everyone was going, oh, my God, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? The fact of the matter is they weren't good candidates, and that's just the truth. And this is coming from someone I spent the entire month of December in Georgia door knocking for these two candidates. And the fact of the matter is I didn't even believe in them as I was door knocking for them. I was doing everything I was doing with volunteers simply to try to re retain control of the Senate. But what we're going to have to do at this point is just look forward because – there's so much amazing new talent in the conservative movement and so many, dare I use the word, diverse voices, diverse faces in the conservative movement who, frankly, were not acknowledged whatsoever by the establishment. Uh, here's one example. Uh, I'll, you know, I am a gay hairstylist who two and a half years ago, I had no money, I had no political contacts, I had no media contacts, but what I had was a really good idea, which was to start at the time a social media movement uh, telling people to walk away from the Democratic Party if they felt like this party no longer represented them. This has turned into a huge success in just two years time, again, with me having really uh, uh, no advantages necessary to, to be able to succeed. And yet, even with that, I've never received a call from anyone within the GOP. I've never been contacted by anyone in the, uh, the, Republican, the Republican establishment. I mean, wouldn't you think that they would look at someone like myself and say, wow, this guy probably has some talent, or wow, this, there's something really happening here. We should bring this into our tent. And, and no, not, not whatsoever. And you look around at a lot of these incredible new upcoming uh, conservative influencers or exciting new candidates that are coming up. The GOP has, in, has completely ignored them. Who are some other names? Up, Brandon, who are some other names that you think are being ignored? Well, I mean, look around at some of the upcoming kind of black conservatives, the Hispanic conservatives, uh, you know, a lot of people that I think are uh, people who are blowing up and making uh, have a big following on social media. I, I was very bothered when I watched the uh, the GOP convention this year, and it was no, none of those voices were being acknowledged. Uh, it was, again, just the same sort of establishment Republican politicians coming out and speaking. I thought it was totally tone deaf. So, I mean, we have to. I think we, we have to demand of GOP leadership if the party is going to survive to start acknowledging the exciting and not just the voices, but also the ways in which we're going to communicate and start doing outreach for God's sake. I mean, that's the, really interesting, Brandon, because they just reaffirmed uh, Ronna McDaniel as the chairwoman. Do you think that was a mistake? Yes. Absolutely, it was a mistake. I don't know what this woman has done for the Republican Party. I know that she ran unopposed, so I know that there was no that there was no competition there for for someone else to take the the reins of leadership. But I can tell you, I've never gotten a call from Ronna McDaniel's. I know Scott Pressler, who has probably registered more new Republican voters than anyone in the entire country, has never heard from Ronna McDaniel's. I know that a number of people that you know when we've done our Black Americans town halls, our Hispanic. Americans, American town halls. They don't hear from Ronna McDaniels, these amazing voices that are out recruiting, recruiting new voters to the Republican Party. Uh, I, I say that I probably am responsible for hundreds of thousands of new voters coming over to the right. I don't get contacted by anyone in the GOP. I mean, they're blatantly ignoring this. And then when they do their conventions, or if they put the same 70 year old people up on a stage uh, that aren't inspiring anybody and aren't re representative of the changing face of the Republican Party. It's outrageous. And um, and so I I'm, I'm saying that uh, there needs to be a major change. We need to. And, and again, about the issue of outreach, um, you know, Donald Trump doubled the LGBT vote in 2020 as compared to what he received in 2016. Walkaway was the only organization that was doing outreach for the LGBT community. We spent the last two years doing LGBT town halls around the country, in addition to our black and Hispanic and other minority focused town halls. Now, Donald Trump's policies, I think, are amazing, and that's what brought people over to Donald Trump. But I absolutely, with all modesty, can stand here and say that I believe it was Walkaway who was hugely instrumental in getting that a large portion of Brandon, those LGBT Brandon, would you go work for the Republican Party if they called you today? 
Well, it would have to be conditional. I mean, I would have to sit down and say, look, I'm not going to do business as usual with you guys. You're going to have to listen to my ideas. You're going to have to listen to the ideas of people that are working, that are changing this party. And if you're willing to do that, I'm willing to help you. But I'm not going to be some lackey for the Republican Party if it's going to continue to be business as usual because they have a losing strategy. And we've, we've seen that by virtue of the fact that we have lost everything. All right, Brandon Strzok, thanks so much for joining us here at Just the News AM. Come back soon. Thank you. Hey there, good morning. Welcome back to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad you're with us. Well, let's close the show with looking at what's going to happen, what's on tap tomorrow for Inauguration Day. There is something clever. They, the design, it looks like the Biden Inaugural Committee tweeted out a sneak peek. They said, check out our art installation of nearly 200,000 state and territory flags accompanied by 56 pillars of light. We can't wait for this to be showcased on Inauguration Day. And you can see it there. It kind of reminds me, you can see them putting it up there on uh, in real time in the video. They're planting those flags. They're making a shape of the United States out of the flags themselves. And the, uh, the, the beams of light that they're talking about, to me, it reminds me of the 9-11 memorial. I, I've spent almost a decade in New York, and you can see the beams of light there in the photo where they're just shooting up. But let's focus on the number here. So he says we're doing 56 beams of light. Make no mistake what he's signaling about this. There's 50 states in the union. And what they're trying to do with this 56 pillars of light is to signal their intention. There is a lot of evidence to suggest that the Biden administration is gonna be pushing to put in six new states. These would be six new states who would give him more electoral votes, six new states who would basically turn the United States more into the European Union. Guys, we already know what just happened to the European Union, it's collapsing. Do we really want to go down this road? I think we know what Margaret Thatcher would say. Uh, you shouldn't be subsidizing these types of states because so many of them are fiscally irresponsible. All right, that does it for us. We'll be back tomorrow.